Good afternoon and evening, alumni, parents, and friends. My name is Kaylee Burns. I'm Assistant Dean of Biomedical Advancement here at the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University. It is my pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining us today for Preventing Alzheimer's Disease, a webinar with Dr. Stephen Salloway. Before we begin, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, questions for Dr. Salloway can be submitted via, via the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Following his presentation, we're gonna begin with a few of the questions that were pre-submitted through the RSVP form, and then we will proceed to any questions that are asked here live. With that, it is my privilege privileged to introduce Dr. Stephen Salloway, recognized as a leading expert in aging, Alzheimer's disease, and other memory disorders. Dr. Salloway is the Martin M. Zucker Professor for Psychiatry and Human Behavior and Professor of Neurology at the Warren Alpert Medical School. He is the Director of Neurology in the Memory and Aging Program at Butler Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. During his nearly 30 years at Brown, the Butler Hospital Memori Memory and Aging Program has become an internationally recognized center for clinical research in Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Salloway has been and continues to be one of the leading researchers studying and testing new diagnostic procedures and new treatments for people afflicted with Alzheimer's disease and other memory disorders. His accolades and accomplishments are far too extensive for me to mention all now as they will take me the full hour so I'm going to leave it as we are honored to have him as a member of the Brown medical community and are grateful for his pivotal work. Thank you so much, Dr. Salloway, for joining us today. Well, thanks very much, Kaylee. And thanks to all of you who are attending and taking time out of your busy schedules to learn about this and more about this important topic and what Brown is doing in the field of Alzheimer's research. The focus this afternoon is gonna be on preventing Alzheimer's disease. There we go. So let's talk about why is this topic so important? It's really because of the magnitude of the problem. I know we're all struggling with COVID and everything else, just about every other medical condition is taking a back seat, but the Alzheimer epidemic is moving forward. And so we need to keep up the fight. The problem is that the age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's. The rate doubles every five years after age 65. It's predicted that there'll be at least 125 million people worldwide with dementia by 2050. And women are more impacted than men, both with the disease itself and as caregivers uh, for people with Alzheimer's disease. The cost of care is greater than that than the cost of care for cancer and heart disease combined. So this is a major health problem and we need to rise to the occasion because it threatens our, not only the livelihood of us, all of us as we age, but really our health economy. And the impact is not equal uh, across communities. Uh, Hispanic, the Hispanic and Latino community has a 1.5 increased risk over Caucasians, and the African American community has a, a two times increased risk. And one of the big problems in Alzheimer's research is that there is, uh, we've had difficulty recruiting large numbers of people from the Latinx and African American communities, and we don't really know how well our findings uh, will generalize to those communities. There may be other genetic and other uh, comorbidities, other risk factors that are impacting and causing dementia. So this is a priority for Brown, and it's also a priority for the field of Alzheimer's research. It's clearly a priority for the field of developing a coronavirus vaccine because these communities are equally at higher risk. Brown is moving forward and I'm really excited. And I, as Kaylee said, I've been here a long time. I've only really had one job uh, since I finished my residency at Yale and came here. Um, and 
there's in, been an increasing focus on bench to bedside research here at Brown, bringing discoveries from the laboratory to the patient. And I think Brown is really well positioned to carry this fight forward across a number of major diseases. And I base that, uh, and if you're Brown alums, you know uh, the kind of learning environment here is very collaborative, very interdisciplinary, and that's just what we need is bringing all talents and perspectives to bear in the fight against difficult diseases like Alzheimer's. And we've really, uh, we are building a very powerful scientific community. I want to give a huge shout out to the leadership, to uh, Dean Elias and uh, to Diane Lipscomb and to Sam Menkoff and to President Paxson um, for everyone is aligned and recognizes this is a key priority for the medical school. We want to build real strength and translational medical research and Alzheimer's is a key area of focus among other diseases that we want to focus on. And this renewed energy and renaissance, I would say, in the approach to Alzheimer's disease has really generated a terrific response from a Brown supporters and the Brown, the greater Brown community. And I've been so impressed as I've had a chance to meet many of you out in the community, not so much lately, but prior to COVID uh, and to talk over this important issue that people are very concerned and very responsive and want to help. And uh, you may have heard about the $100 million gift from the Carney family to, to advance brain science uh, at Brown, which is really terrific. And the $50 million gift from Sam and Ann Menkoff for translational medical research for the Brown Institute for Translational Science. And uh, just about a year and a half ago, an anonymous gift from, a, from an alumnus uh, to endow two new professorships for Alzheimer's research, and we recruited just uh, some really talented young scientists who are already making a big difference here at Brown uh, against Alzheimer's, and this whole initiative is moving forward. So I'm very, very excited to be part of it. Brown, I want, it may not be well known because the medical school is a lot younger than the university, uh, but Brown, uh, is a pioneer already in Alzheimer's prevention. Um, at our program here, based at Butler Hospital, we've conducted more than 120 clinical research trials for Alzheimer's disease over the time I've been here. Uh, I currently lead a staff of 45 um, scientists and professional staff, and that group is growing. Uh, we're currently conducting more than 20 um, funded clinical trials for new treatments and diagnostic tests. Our outreach team is working very actively with the community to find new models for community involvement because this is a really a much bigger problem that can be solved in a single memory clinic. It really requires a, a broad community approach, a public-private partnership. I think Rhode Island and Brown is just the right size and has the right community spirit to really carry this forward. And we've been very forward, uh, very uh, fortunate to publish, um, uh, to, to contribute to a number of leading publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, in Nature and other major medical journals. I'm very happy to, to say that uh, as of today, I have two manuscripts, I'm part of two manuscripts under consideration at the New England Journal of Medicine. So I'm very excited about that. People always ask me, how did I get involved in Alzheimer's research? And I think my story is very similar probably to many people uh, on today's call or webinar and many people who are concerned about Alzheimer's disease because of a, a, a family member that has had the disease or someone they know well who's had Alzheimer's. And in my case, my first exposure was to my grandmother, who you can see here, Lena Salloway. Uh, of blessed memory. <clears throat> and she uh, developed dementia when I was about nine or 10 years old and couldn't live uh, on her own. <clears throat> and so she um, came to stay with us for a while. There was only one bed 
uh, in extra bed in the house. That was in my room. So she stayed with me and she was my roommate uh, for a time. And I got to see really what the impact is of dementia on the person, on the family, and all the stress that it causes. You can see there's a picture of me here on the left as a baby with uh, you know, four generations of my family. And she had a long course of dementia I, and I had close contact with her all the way through. So I really understand the impacts on family, the impact it has on a family. And it's made me a better doctor, I can tell you that much, because when people describe what they're going through, I totally understand. And it's terrible, especially the later stages of the disease. And so the whole focus really, like any major disease, is to get in there early and prevent the disability and the, and the real impact of the illness. Uh, so when I was in medical school uh, out at Stanford, I was thinking of uh, what I was going to focus on. I was definitely interested in brain diseases. And I'm sure my experience with my grandmother really, I knew the urgent need and the urgent unmet need in that area. And I think that directed me to, to focus my career on Alzheimer's research. Now what's going on in the brain in Alzheimer's disease? We're learning more and more. And here are some of the original drawings of Dr. Alzheimer from 1906 with his first patient who came to post-mortem examination. It was already known that there were clumps of protein that could build up in the, plane, in the brain with aging. Uh, and there were plaques that were formed accumulating between nerve cells. And what Dr. Alzheimer's described was also the tangles, another clump, different protein that was forming right inside the nerve cell and basically choking off the nerve cell over time. And it turns out that the plaques uh, start building up 15 to 20 years before the memory loss. So there's a very slow process going on in the brain. This creates a toxic environment, these changes in amyloid, these protein aggregates that stimulate an immune response. Part of the immune system is trying to clear the, the debris, but another part of it gets overstimulated and actually exerts a toxic effect. And this combination of these protein aggregates and the change in cellular metabolism with aging of neurons causes neurons eventually to degenerate. And the synapses, the connections between neurons, which are so vital for normal brain function, start to break down. And that's where cognitive impairment comes in. And by late stage, as you see on the right, the brain really shrinks dramatically because this process has been going on so long and has really caused, you know, a degeneration, substantial degeneration in the brain. The key here is really to intervene early. We have this long silent period while the person's functioning perfectly well, uh, where we can uh, try to turn the process off or certainly dampen it. And the, the ultimate goal is to get in there even before uh, these brain changes start occurring, if we can identify people at risk. So, uh, a big focus here at Brown, uh, and I don't have time to go into all the research here on Alzheimer's disease. So much has happened in the positive direction recently, I'm happy to say, uh, across disciplines. Uh, but I will speak to things that we're working on directly is really uh, improving our detection of risk and especially early before there are symptoms where we still have time to keep the brain healthy. We're testing drugs that can help slow the progression of the disease. And we are very much in, uh, aligned with making basic scientific discoveries that will identify new targets and new treatments that we can test here at Brown and, and our other Alzheimer's centers across the globe. One big advance in Dr. Alzheimer's time and up till about five to 10 years ago we had to wait till someone passed away to definitively identify the plaques and the tangles and make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And one thing we've been able to do is to safely detect the plaques and now the tangles with, PET, with tracers and PET scans 
uh, well before the memory loss and allowing us to stage the disease more accurately, even if people in people with no symptoms at all. And this has been a major advance and I can't say how moved I am by how this came about. And many Rhode Islanders uh, played a role in this. We were involved in, in the pivotal trials and I was the lead author on one of these that has led to FDA approval. The FDA required that people who were terminally ill underwent a PET scan. And then when they passed away, they donated their brain. And we compared what we saw in the scan with what we saw under the microscope. So this was literally their last contribution to science. And uh, I get choked up every time I talk about it. It was very moving to go to basically people on their deathbed in their willingness uh, to make this contribution and the big impact that it's had. And we now have the ability, I can't, we can't get Medicare to pay for it yet, but we now can safely use these scans to diagnose Alzheimer's. And the diagnosis, if you go see a general clinician, even an expert, is can be wrong up to 30% of the time. And then we have a way to verify that. And hopefully soon, these will come into more frequent clinical use. But this is a big advance. And we now have our first approval just two months ago, and we have been very actively involved in that here at Butler Hospital and Rhode Island Hospital, um, affiliated with Brown, in getting our first tau PET scan approved by the FDA. So now that we have these two, we can see these two components in the brain, we can look at someone who is cognitively normal here uh, on the left, and you can see there's really no buildup of amyloid or tau. Here's someone who's also an older person who's cognitively normal, but a lot of amyloid already and tau is starting to spread. And this person really has the beginning of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, even though they have no symptoms. So this would be a great person to target for treatment to see if we can delay or prevent the memory loss itself. And in later stages, the amyloid becomes even more widespread in the tau also. And that's what causes the nerve cells to degenerate. So many people ask, why would I want to know? Is it a good idea to find out about your risk for Alzheimer's disease? We also have a new genetic test, a cheek swab, which you can do for the most common risk gene, the APOE gene, E4 gene. Uh, you can do that through 23andMe, though I don't recommend it uh, because there's no physician uh, or clinician guiding you into the meaning of the test. But we do that here to help people identify their risk and see if they're interested in research and trying to lower their risk. So some of the big, this is a very personal decision about finding out this is important medical information. Medical information brings uh, more power uh, to make decisions. And people who are starting to experience the early stages of Alzheimer's, especially the early clinical stages where memory loss has begun, have to make important decisions. They may be working full time. They may have a very responsible job. They may have to do some important financial planning, uh, decide about driving safety, uh, crucial decisions. They may be eligible for medications already approved or uh, eligible to participate in research to lower their risk or slow the disease process. So there's a lot to be gained, but you have to be psychologically prepared to find out. Now, the good news is that if, and I'll show you some of the prevention trials that we're doing, that on, under our current protocols, if you're cognitively normal in the age range of 65 or 60 to 85, 70% of the people who come for an amyloid PET scan to see if they're eligible for a trial are not building up plaques and are not at risk for developing Alzheimer's in, in the foreseeable future for years to come. It's very reassuring news. So you, the majority of time, and at least the way we're structuring the trials right now, people get good news and find out they're at lower risk. And the people that find out they're at higher risk uh, have options available to them to try to lower that risk and be part of the journey and the process of trying to make breakthroughs for Alzheimer's. Now, one of the big problems with the PET scans 
is that they're expensive. They're not available in every community. Um, they have a short half-life, so they have to be delivered from the site where they're manufactured. So if there's a long distance involved, it makes for a lot of logistical challenges. And I'm happy to say that we're moving forward with new diagnostic tests that it may be that it will be more widely available and cost effective. One of these that we're working very closely with our colleagues at the University of Rhode Island is in a major trial of retina, retinal imaging. The eye is really the outward extension of the brain. And we can see in there some of the early buildup of amyloid protein um, um, on OCT, one of the retinal scans that are typically done in doctor's offices. We can also see that the layers of the retina start to change in subtle ways that we can measure, and also that the blood vessels change in their shape and contour in Alzheimer's disease. So it may be possible if we can validate this technique that a test that's already in eye doctor's offices can be adapted to screen for Alzheimer's disease. Another big advance, which I'm really excited about, is uh, there are now a number of blood tests that are looking very promising uh, for detecting uh, Alzheimer changes in the brain that correlate very well with the buildup of amyloid and tau protein in the brain. We're already using them in research. This is moving quickly. It took us years to get to this point, but that the science has moved forward. And they will be coming soon to the clinic. So more of us will be having to face this decision about whether or not to find out about our Alzheimer's risk. And it may be in the, in the near future that uh, a primary care doctor may be able to order a blood test for Alzheimer's disease. But we all need to be prepared to, to understand what the meaning of the result is, including the clinician. So there's gonna be a big educational process involved along with science. Ultimately, our goal is to develop treatment breakthroughs that change the course of the disease, that lower risk, slow the disease process. Uh, we've been working very hard at this. I can't say enough about our uh, dedicated and courageous study volunteers who agreed to participate in these medication trials, sometimes being the first in the world to receive a, a new drug. Um, it's it's a great inspiration to all of us, those who kept coming to our center to get these test medications during COVID, putting themselves at risk, our staff who came in, it's very inspiring to me. And one of the most exciting, when you work so hard at something, there's, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, disappointing results in research and in Alzheimer's research. But every now and then you get something that's really uplifting. And so this, the two six, 2016 report in the journal Nature, which made the cover, which was really thrilling, uh, of a drug that being developed by Biogen that uh, called aducanumab that gets into the brain, binds to the plaques. It's an antibody that binds to the amyloid plaques, stimulates the immune cells to clear the plaque. And we demonstrated that there were, in an early trial that there was substantial removal of plaque after a year and also a slowing down of memory loss. And uh, you may have heard just recently, uh, Biogen has submitted this drug to the FDA for approval. And if approved, this would be the first drug approved for Alzheimer's in 17 years. And the first one that really targets a core uh, component of the disease. And I, I think this would be the beginning of the modern treatment era for Alzheimer's disease. If it's approved, we would then have to use the amyloid PET scan to detect the plaque, start treating uh, patients uh, with this medicine to hopefully slow down the memory loss and then build on that. This would be not the cure, but the beginning of breakthroughs for Alzheimer's. So we'll have to wait and see. We have about four more months FDA has four more months to make a final decision, but I'm sure it'll get tremendous press coverage either way. I'm very happy to report, it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, but there's just a lot of good things going on at the same time, which is great given how tough it's been with COVID for everybody. 
Uh, but just last week, um, we, uh, David Calver, who you see picture on this slide with his wife, Rosalind, was the first man in the world to get a, an antibody that removes plaque and, to prevent Alzheimer's disease. We've been testing medicines like this for people who already have memory loss and the early signs of dementia. But David is, is 63, is perfectly cognitively normal, works full-time as a hospital recruiter, has no cognitive impairment whatsoever. But both his parents had Alzheimer's disease. He carries two copies of the risk gene for Alzheimer's, so putting him at higher risk. And he is just a very, he and his wife are very forward thinking people and uh, very generous. And he said uh, recently at the time of his first infusion, knowledge gives me confidence and my goal is to work toward a breakthrough. He wants to lower the stigma so that more people will participate in Alzheimer's research. And he's very out front with his work and, with, and very generous with any request to discuss uh, his, and his participation and his, and his reasons for doing so. Uh, you may have heard recently about another important trial which takes a very different approach. And this is modifying uh, risk factors, lifestyle risk factors for Alzheimer's. So there was a report a couple of years ago in The Lancet that 35% of dementia risk may be modifiable. Um, and we're hoping uh, that a vigorous exercise, aerobic exercise, a Mediterranean type diet, cognitive stimulation with brain training exercises, and good heart health will lower the rate of stroke and lower the rate of Alzheimer's and dementia. And we're very excited to be one of five sites uh, in the United States to carry out this trial. It's called the US Pointer Trial, sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association and the National Institute of Health. And we're gonna rigorously test uh, whether or not this particular approach in a structured way with lots of coaching and lots of socialization will uh, delay memory loss in people at risk age 60 to 79. And we'll compare it to people who learn about these strategies but aren't coached regularly um, and do it on their, their self-guided. And we'll see uh, what the value is of a really rigorous program, multi, uh, multi-domain approach to lowering uh, Alzheimer's risk. And I see these two as very um, complementary that we all wanna do this to promote our brain health and our heart health as we age so we live longer and live well as we age. And for some people at higher risk for Alzheimer's, we're gonna need some of those uh, plaque bust busting drugs and other approaches uh, to complement this. Now, we would be remiss by not commenting uh, some about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on Alzheimer's research. Um, it's, you know, as you, as we all know, COVID has had a damper on everything. <laughs> and certainly patients with Alzheimer's disease living in congregate care settings and nursing homes have been very vulnerable to this disease and have died at much higher rates. It's also had an impact on Alzheimer's research. So we've continued the medication trials throughout. My hat's off to all the people who made that possible using very careful precautions. But we had to suspend some of our observational trials. And for example, the pointer trial, we were set to have a big announcement, a press conference at the State House. President Paxson and Governor Raimondo and Senator Whitehouse, and we we're so excited. And we had to put it off uh, from April to May to June, and finally it never happened. And we had to launch it virtually. Um, so it just shows you the impact. Finally, we have launched that trial. And I really want to thank President Paxson and Senator Whitehouse and Governor Raimondo, who all advocated for having Brown and Rhode Island be one of the five pointer sites in the US. Um, each of them personally got involved and made it happen for us. So thank you so much. 
Um, and all our research conferences, I had a whole, I planning to speak all around the world on many continents this past year, and they're all now virtual, which is a little confusing when you have 20,000 people at a meeting online. It's, it's very hard to, to get your head around, especially if you're of a certain age. So this is an adjustment for uh, all of us. I want to talk a little bit because uh, people often ask, how is your uh, research supported? And certainly we get support from the NIH, from foundations like the Alzheimer's Association, uh, from working on pharma sponsored trials. And also a key component is philanthropy. And I just wanted to give you an example of one gift from a, an important Brown donor um, that just had, has had a huge impact, especially for our young investigators. So we were um, developing an Alzheimer's prevention registry where people could sign up to find out uh, more about their Alzheimer's risk, what research is going on. And they could sign up either in person, on phone or online. And we thought this is really gonna be critical for identifying people, research participants, for engaging the community, and for generating data for our uh, young investigators, especially. And it's just been terrific. This one gift, it started out, we had very modest expectations. As of today, I heard that our current uh, uh, number of registrants is, is uh, four threes, 3,333. And over 800 people have been screened for clinical trials, making us one of the leading clinical trial centers in the world. And our investigators have used this initial data and, as a, and, and for feasibility with four grants funded, three under review. It just has a huge impact on a young investigator's career to get their first R01, uh, their first clinician scientist award. It's been terrific. Uh, led to important publications. We've been doing uh, swab events in the community and, and Brown alumni have really helped with this. And during alumni um, weekend, uh, graduation weekend, we've had, it's hard to do it now, but we've had swab events, swab parties, we called them back then. Uh, and on one occasion, we had a, a hundred Brown alums uh, attending the event and most of them swabbing to find out about their APOE genotype was terrific, a really great community spirit. Um, and so this work, having this registry is such a valuable resource um, because we can use it for our imaging and plasma biomarker work. We're working uh, closely with the bioinformatics uh, faculty on uh, developing a risk algorithm based on machine learning. Um, we're in the process of developing a memory prevention clinic where people can find out more about their risk um, and get the support and guidance uh, about what that means and what, their, uh, what options are available to them. And increasingly, we're focusing on outreach to diverse populations to make sure our sample is really representative of our larger community and region. Let me just close with telling you about a few really exciting advances. And this is really what it's all about. This is what can be so amazing at a place like Brown that has a little less of the trappings and size of some other uh, sister institutions where it's often easier to get things done. So um, we wanna move quickly when there's a discovery from the bench to the bedside. One of these uh, to highlight is a recent discovery published in Nature from John Sedevi's lab, who's pictured here, showing that some HIV drugs block age-related inflammation and could be effective for Alzheimer's disease. And this led quickly, this discovery, to a biotech startup called Transposon Therapeutics, uh, a major grant from the Alzheimer's Association called Part the Cloud, and is moving quickly to clinical trials in Alzheimer's patients here at Brown and at our center. So this is just a terrific advance, and we're moving quickly to see, to, to try to bring it to, for the benefit of patients. Another example uh, you may have heard about is uh, uh, two uh, Brown undergraduates, uh, Joshua Cohen and Justin Klee. Um, Joshua was a, this graduated in 2014. 
was a, a in biomedical engineering, uh, and uh, Justin Justin concentrated in neuroscience. They started tinkering around with ideas about how nerve cells degenerate and how to keep them alive, and they came up with a theory of how they could combine two drugs that are both available uh, into a new new treatment for neurodegenerative disorders. And just three weeks ago, they published a lead article. They, fo they formed a, a, a startup company um, and uh, called Amelix. And this combination, which you see listed here, showed some uh, promising benefit for ALS. And they're also testing it for Alzheimer's disease. So this is just the kind of environment we want to foster here with where talented young people can take their ideas and uh, be creative and see where it leads them. And hopefully to amazing results like this one. So together we can prevent Alzheimer's disease. How can we do it? Uh, well, we need, this is, we need the whole Brown community um, to support, support this scientific effort. You can get involved as volunteers or in, uh, in screening and trials. Definitely spreading the word is very important as we're doing today. It, it provides more information, helps reduce the stigma and makes it easier for, for uh, advances to take place. Dr. Salloway, thank you so much for that. Um, we do have some questions that came in via the RSVP form that I thought we would start with, and then we've had a few come in live. Um, so one of the first ones that came in that's kind of overarching is Alzheimer's is a term used for dementia, but are all dementias considered Alzheimer's? Right. That's a very frequently asked question. And uh, dementia is the general term that means that there's cognitive impairment that interferes with day-to-day -day functioning, but it doesn't describe the term, the cause. And there are many things that can cause dementia. Alzheimer's is often associated with dementia because it's so common. It's the most common, is the disease that's the most common cause of dementia. But certainly football players can get dementia from repeated head injury. Um, people with Parkinson's, people with stroke, people with HIV, people who uh, can have alcohol-related dementia, et cetera. There are many, many causes of dementia, but Alzheimer's is the disease that's the most common cause of dementia. So there were also quite a few, um, both tonight and earlier, that were around the topic of genetics. And, you know, is Alzheimer's inherited or based on environmental factors. And the same is dementia hereditary. Right. That's another good question uh, that people commonly ask. So age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's. So understanding how neurons age and how to promote their viability so they are healthy as long as we're alive is really an important strategy. And it's a big focus here at Brown in our brain science and translational science programs. Uh, genetics is the another very important contribution to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, so if you come, if you have one or more first degree family members, a parent or a sibling or a child with Alzheimer's, then you're going to be at higher risk. And we know that there are certain genes. So one of them is called a dominant gene. This affects a little less than 1% of all, all Alzheimer patients. If you have this, this is a mutation in one of three known genes. If you have that mutation, the chance of developing Alzheimer's is almost 100%. So it's deterministic and the age of onset varies by family, but it's usually in the 40s or early 50s. So that's an early onset aggressive form of Alzheimer's but it's less than 1% of all Alzheimer's. In terms of science, it is so critical to, and I can't say enough good things about the families that we work with who carry these mutations, because that's how we're gonna learn about what's happening with Alzheimer's 20 or 30 years. That's where we've gotten really our 
basic information about the timeline of Alzheimer's changes in the brain, because we can do a blood test to see who carries this gene and compare it with a family member that doesn't have it and see what's changing in the brain and when it's changing. But that's a very small percentage. The most common risk gene is the one I mentioned, the APOE4 gene. And about 25% of people carry that gene. It does vary somewhat by race. And if you have one copy of this gene, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get Alzheimer's, but it puts you at higher risk, about three times higher risk with slightly earlier onset than no copies. And if you carry two copies, uh, like David, who I showed you in this presentation, you're at even higher risk and then with even earlier onset. So that's an important piece of information about your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And it's not routinely included in 23andMe, but if you check the box for finding that out, they do do that test and they, you can learn that. And I'm not recommending it to go fly solo with that because it's such important information. It's good to talk to a knowledgeable clinician about it. And there are obviously other genes too. The question about environmental. Well, the most important environmental effect is more lifestyle and other medical conditions. So if you have stroke and Alzheimer's, you're more likely to be demented than if you just have Alzheimer's. So there is an additive effect. So if you could prevent a stroke, that's why good heart health is so important. You're gonna lower your chance of getting Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, and we think that dietary factors and other things can help promote better brain health and lower the risk of Alzheimer's. There are other genes that are yet to be discovered that we're working very actively on that have, may have a more subtle impact, but we haven't identified them fully yet. That's great. Um, thank you for that. It's like you almost read one of the questions that I was about to ask you for the follow-up. Um, but I do have one other in this space. So if you are APO negative, what is your risk of Alzheimer's? Okay. Well, if you die early, your risk is very low. Uh, it turns out that you can still get Alzheimer's if, without carrying an APOE4, a copy of APOE4. Uh, the average age of onset is about 85. And so if you look at all Alzheimer patients, about half of them have no copies of E4, but most of them occur later in life. Uh, so, you know, it would be, um, more likely in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s. Great. So can you talk a little bit about what factors besides genetics have been found as contributing to Alzheimer's? Well, don't bang your head too many times so that you have concussions because you can get a different type of tangle that builds up in chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which we see in the football players and other athletes with too many head collisions. So, you know, just some common sense, keeping your head protected uh, and avoiding that. Um, I think the lifestyle factors that I recommended are, we, we need to prove them, you know, and have the evidence for them. But pro I think that's a good strategy to try to keep your brain healthy. There's a lot of theories about other things that cause Alzheimer's. I know people will ask about supplements I'm sure that there are things we can supplement in our diet. And that's why we're recommending, at least right now, the Mediterranean diet. Um, but specific supplements, none of them have actually been proved. So people ask about fish oil and uh, Prevagen and um, avoiding aluminum pans and all kinds of things. But there's really no strong evidence. Even a, even a multivitamin hasn't been proven to prevent Alzheimer's. So. There will be things to, uh, to be identified in the future, but none that we can recommend specifically as a supplement. Thank you for that. Um, so before we move on, we have a few that are actually pointer trial specific, but I want to touch on two other ones that came in about risk factors. Um, so at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that women are disproportionately higher at risk for developing Alzheimer's than men. Do we have any idea as to why this is? Right, that's a great question. We're very interested in the, in the answer to that. It, this seems to be over and above longevity because women you know, enjoy a longevity, greater longevity than men. Um, I'm sure that there are hormonal factors. Um, 
you know, associated with the drop off of estrogen later in life. Um, we were part of an estrogen and progesterone prevention trial uh, run out of Mount Sinai in New York, um, but it had to be stopped because of the results of the Women's Health Initiative showing that supplementation with estrogen and progesterone actually had other harmful medical side effects. And so that we never got the answer to the also whether or not that prevented Alzheimer's. So definitely there's a hormonal component. Um, there may be a genetic component, but it really hasn't been carefully identified. So that's an important area of study to really, that's an important clue that there are some differences there. One thing we found in, in one of our first prevention trials that women who are cognitively normal, 65 to 85, are actually building up tau protein a little bit earlier than men. And we don't know the reason for that. Very interesting. As a woman, yeah. I look forward to seeing what else you learn on this right. space. Well, women, the other the other big issue for women is that I think two thirds of the caregivers for Alzheimer's patients are women. And so it has a big impact. Caregiving has a big impact on spouses, on children, especially if if the child has a family of her own and has children to care for and has to care for her parents. That's very and the, and, and and one of her parents is deceased then it's a very stressful time and it can go on for a very prolonged period. And so caregiving, caregivers' health is at risk. And so that's very important to figure out how we, we can do such a better job. I haven't focused on caregiving at all. That is a major interest here at Brown. We just got, Brown got its largest grant ever uh, for a caregiving and dementia treatment grant, which is terrific. That's a whole nother dimension of the work that's going on here and so needed uh, and Rhode Island just got a Center of uh, Excellence Award from the CDC just two weeks ago to study caregiving and treatment uh, because caregivers' health is, is at risk uh, because of the chronic stress of caregiving. You read ahead on my questions again, so I can cross that one off as being okay. addressed. So one other that's about risk factors is again, earlier in your presentation, you spoke to the risk factors of Hispanic and Latino populations. And someone asked if you could speak towards the risk of Alzheimer's amongst different Asian populations. That's a good question. I haven't seen a lot of data about that. Um, I know in Japan where people live the longest, it's a huge issue because they have such a large aging population, so an at-risk population. Um, there are some variations across ethnic and racial groups in terms of the rate of APOE4, the rate of amyloid buildup in the brain, uh, certainly comorbidities, so other conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking patterns, um, you know, high cholesterol, obesity, and so forth that impact uh, Alzheimer's and dementia risk, and these may vary by different ethnic and racial groups. Um, so I think the rate of APOE4 carriage, and I have to be checked on this, is slightly lower in some Asian populations, but certainly um, they, this is a worldwide problem. Every, every country is dealing with this issue. Thanks. Um, so I do want to address a few of the questions that came in that are around um, prevention and the idea of lifestyle, which is very in line with the pointer trial that you mentioned. Can you discuss the role of aerobic exercise and prevention in Alzheimer's? And when you do that, I know you're very early on that the trial hasn't officially launched and so we don't have many results, but do we know already if there's any specific type of exercise that's better for prevention than others? Um, and then also the same question around dietary supplementation. Right. Well, we have data from the FINGER trial, which was conducted in Finland, where they did this multi-domain intervention with aerobic exercise, Mediterranean diet, uh, brain training, and heart health and they showed cognitive benefits in, after two years in people at risk. And so um, pointer was modeled on that finger trial. We thought it was more polite to call it pointer in the US rather than finger. And so that's where the name came about. Um, so we do have data from that. And it looks like aerobic exercise not only promotes heart health, but improves blood flow to the brain and also stimulates nerve, nerve growth factors 
uh, in the brain, which could uh, help keep the brain, uh, give more resilience. And there may be other factors as well. But so the focus in the pointer trial is on vigorous aerobic exercise, hopefully four times a week and trying to get the heart rate up to a certain level. That's the focus of the exercise there. Um, the, and the diet is really a Mediterranean type diet with um, olive oil and fish and fruits and vegetables um, as the focus there. Thanks for that. Um, so before we go into kind of some of the upcoming progress and things that we need in order to move this forward, I did want to touch base again. You, you talked a little bit about the importance and impact on early detection. And, you know, every time I've had the opportunity to work with you on a presentation at any type of event or, you know, virtually on the computer now, this topic always comes up in question after question. And so I'm hoping you can talk just a little bit more about the impact on of early identification for Alzheimer's disease and what there might be at risk for that, um, meaning is there a risk on obtaining long-term health insurance? Okay. Is there a risk right. for upcoming right. care? Right. Well, depends how things go with Obamacare, <laughs> with the Affordable Care Act, because there are certain protections that are in place now. Um, well, the rationale is that um, Alzheimer's goes on over many years in the brain. It, would, it starts very gradually and nerve cells are preserved by and large for many years. But as the tempo of the disease picks up, then neurodegeneration begins and nerve cells start to decline. And that's when the cognitive impairment becomes noticeable. And, and as that progresses, the person eventually becomes disabled if it goes on long enough. So it just makes sense to get in there early. It, the earliest, the, the goal would be primary prevention. There's no detectable amyloid or tau, but we know either for, for, for genetic or metabolic factors that the person's at risk for developing Alzheimer's at some point, and we wanna to try to modify that risk as, as early as possible. So having this lifestyle intervention should not start at age 60. I mean, pointer starts from 60 to 79. This is a lifelong approach to keeping our heart and our brain healthy, I think. And I, in communities where there is good heart health, people live longer, have less other medical uh, complicated diseases, and they have less dementia. So there are things we can do. This is not an untrue, even before these, you know, power powerhouse breakthroughs that we're talking about, there are things we all can do to keep our heart and our brain healthy. Um, what was the other thing you asked me? Uh, the risk of- Oh, yes, thank you, about, but the impact. So absolutely, it's a great question about what do you know, do you put yourself at risk financially if you find out? Currently, uh, we have a protection in the Affordable Care Act for pre-existing conditions. And so your health insurance should not be at risk if, you, if information were to uh, get out about your future Alzheimer risk. And it also, if you were to be cognitively normal and even have an APOE test or whatever, um, it doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's. It just means you have, you know, a, a higher chance of getting Alzheimer's someday, which could be years or decades away. So anyway, it should not directly, at least currently, impact your health insurance. It could, it, it hasn't to my knowledge in any of our participants, uh, impacted long-term care or life insurance, but it could. If a insurer and they try to deny, they want to lower risk themselves, a different type of risk. Um, if they were to, you know, access that information, then they could take that into account. It's never happened to my knowledge, but that's a potential risk. If you do it through research, uh, that's kept, that information is protected. It's not part of the medical record uh, typically, and so should not be discoverable by an insurance company. Uh, but these are important considerations though, especially if you're starting to have memory problems, and you're not just concerned about your future risk, but there are, symptoms are already developing. Then, and you wanna have long-term care 
uh, or life insurance and you don't at that point, that would be a good time to make those plans before you do more diagnostic testing because that could be in the medical record and that could potentially affect your uh, the insurance decision. Thanks for that. So I have two questions that I want to finish with because we're coming up to the end of our hour. Um, so you mentioned the role philanthropy has played to date, and I'd love you to spend, you know, 45 seconds talking a little bit about what's needed to continue the work and really move research forward at Brown. Right. Well, I think we're just on a great trajectory right now, and thanks in large part to a lot of the support we've, we've received from Brown donors, some of whom I've named and many I haven't. Um, I think uh, getting rising uh, talented young people who are want to make a difference in the fight against Alzheimer's and can make discoveries or translate discoveries or bring these treatments to patients. Um, we, in, I, we've designated some areas of growth for us in the neuroinflammation area. I mentioned that already with Dr. Sedevi's work. We want to expand that area and recruit new scientists, clinician scientists in this area. In bioinformatics and artificial intelligence is big data here to be mined to make sense of risk and developing risk algorithms that we can use. We definitely want to recruit talented faculty from those disciplines, clinician scientists who can do biomarker work, see patients, bring some of these treatments to new treatments to patients. We need support for that. And many of the studies really don't come. It's sort of like uh, undergraduate tuition, doesn't cover everything, seems like a lot, but there's just a lot of expenses in carrying out these trials, millions of dollars with every study, sometimes in the hundreds of millions. And so we always need more support and to, to do, we really wanna do the very best that we can. Thanks for that. So I wanna kind of wrap up in asking one question is, You've highlighted so much promising research that's already taken place at Brown and at Butler in the memory and aging program. And you've given us a taste of some of the things to come. So you might get mad at me for asking this question, but if we're looking forward, you know, five to seven years from now, what do you hope can be accomplished in that time frame? Right. Um, well, I really think we're on the the path to become a powerhouse in Alzheimer's research that Brown is. And what our, we want to keep doing what we're doing is making the, these breakthroughs, either on the diagnostic side or the treatment side. I think hopefully, I don't know what's going to happen with the FDA decision if we have our first really biologically based treatment approved this year, be a game changer, really transformative, get us going in the right direction in the modern era. I look forward to next year, uh, we're gonna be doing some gene editing treatments. I told you these proteins build up, we can get in there and actually turn the genes off and have, have, have drugs that do that. That's gonna be fantastic. There are, people are testing treatments to put little chip in the brain that can actually augment a memory circuit when the memories we can read and whether or not the memory's being recorded properly and stimulate to try to make sure it's recorded properly. I mean, just all kinds of fantastic things are gonna be happening. So uh, I think we're really well positioned to be part of that. And I look forward to sharing that with the broader community because uh, it's so exciting and so needed. I look forward to when you can share that with the broader community as well. Uh, so, Dr. Salloway, I want to thank you for your time, um, for your presentation, and for answering these questions. I know we did not get to everyone's questions. Um, should you have any follow-up questions that you'd like to ask, you can definitely respond to the contact, Kayla Carell, who was in the invitation materials, or you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, I would say that we will be sure to keep everyone up to date with what is happening in Alzheimer's research um, through Dr. Salloway's work in the Greater Brown effort. Um, we will be following up as this has been recorded um, with the recording to attendees later this week so you can rewatch it or share it with others. Um, I would say I'd love you all to join me in thanking 
Dr. Salloway, but because we are on computer, I know everyone is not able to clap or wave or thank you. Um, so I will do it on behalf of all of them. Dr. Salloway, thank you again um, well, thank for your time and your incredible work. Thank all of you and uh, join our prevention registry. Find out more what's going on. There's no obligation. Yes. All right. Wonderful. I hope everyone has a, a wonderful rest of their evening. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. Hope to meet you in person.